Hi, welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Show. Just me and you guys uh, the, today. Uh, I just thought I wanted to take a few minutes to talk to you a little bit about uh, what's happening in Israel. Well, it's uh, the middle of a Passover holiday, uh, and uh, the other day one of the one of our neighbors asked my husband, "Oh, so how's your holiday going?" And uh, my husband said to him, "Well, it started off well," uh, and. Uh, and uh, our neighbor immediately understood what he was talking about. We had a great uh, uh, Seder Eve uh, with the family. Um, and then on Friday, and around 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, there was a uh, terrible terrorist attack on the Jordan Valley Highway. A uh, terrorist um, opened fire, apparently, on an Israeli car. Uh, and pushed it off to the side of the road, forced it off the road. And then uh, with uh, what apparently was a Kalachnikov AK-47 rifle, uh, he executed uh, two of the uh, people inside, and the third one has been critically injured. And in the event, the three people in the car were our neighbors in our town of Efrat, uh, Maya and Rena D. Uh, D. Uh, were murdered. Namaya was 20 and Rena was 15. And uh, their mother, Lucy uh, Lea Batsipola, was critically wounded and she's fighting for her life at uh, Hadassah Hospital. Today, this evening, uh, we joined uh, thousands and thousands of other people from uh, our community of Efrat and Gush Etzion and from around the country uh, at the uh, regional cemetery to uh, bury uh, two young women. And um, and it was a it was a very 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 difficult uh, event to watch. All of the uh, all of the descriptions that uh, the father and the two surviving sisters and the younger brother gave of their lives and who they were were extraordinary. Two extraordinary women, uh, young women who were stolen from us by murderers who killed them simply because they were Jewish. Um, and uh, in in the middle of Passover, when they were going <clears throat> to celebrate uh, this um, this vacation on vacation up uh, apparently in the north, and um, all of all of this is happening on Friday, of course. So uh, when when the D sisters were were murdered and their mother was critically wounded. Um, as uh, Iran has opened up a uh, an all-out offensive against us, which uh, has very strong likelihood of becoming a uh, a six-front war, uh, we have absorbed missile attacks from Gaza, expanded terrorism in Judea and Samaria, and in Jerusalem. We have shooting at us from Lebanon, shooting at us. Uh, missiles attacks from Lebanon, missile attacks from Syria, uh, and we have uh, terrorist attacks being carried out by Israeli Arabs as well. Who not only are rioting, but uh, an Israeli Arab from Shfaram, I think, or no Kfar Qasim, I'm sorry, ran over a group of uh, tourists Friday night in in Tel Aviv and killed uh, an Italian tourist and wounded uh, several other, I think, eight other tourists from Italy and Britain who were on the promenade in Tel Aviv. Um, so uh, we even had an attempt, apparently, by ISIS to attack Israel with weapons, with missiles from the Sinai Desert in Egypt that was apparently uh, scuttled by the Egyptian military. We have the Jordanian king, Abdallah, and his regime that are um, acting uh, to foment the rioting and the violence on the Temple Mount. Uh, they're in charge through the walk that they control of Al-Aqsa uh, mosques, and they've been allowing the uh, uh, terrorists' elements operating on the Temple Mount to 
holed up in the Temple Mount and to store uh, weapons uh, in the mosques with a clear F, with a clear plan of attacking uh, Israeli Jews at the uh, Western Wall beneath the Temple Mount. Um, and every time that the Israeli police have tried to uh, remove the uh, terrorists from the mosques, uh, we see pictures out of context, of course, all uh, posted on the web of uh, police brutally beating uh, poor, guileless uh, Palestinian worshippers or Arab or Muslim worshippers in the Al-Aqsa and under interfering with their freedom of religion when this is a complete lie. What they are, are terrorists who are storing uh, arsenals of, of weapons of terrorism uh, to attack truly innocent Jewish worshippers at the temple at the uh, wailing wall and even muslim worshippers who oppose them we saw actually it was sort of uh, encouraging there was a uh, a cartoon published in a saudi paper of uh, palestinian terrorists at al aqsa saying that uh, the caption read al aqsa is crying out for uh, somebody to save it from uh, these terrorists and and that was quite um, remarkable and encouraging because Saudi Arabia, of course, is uh, 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 normalizing its relations with uh, Iran and a Chinese organized deal. Uh, so we're being attacked by Iran's proxies in all, all of our borders and inside of our own borders. Uh, this is an Iranian operation, and we have to be clear about this because there's been some misinterpretation of events. The fact that the Hamas terrorist attack the Hamas terrorist organization is carrying out a lot of these attacks does not make this not Iranian. We had uh, Hamas leaders meet with Hezbollah chief uh, Hassan Nasrallah in Beirut on uh, Sunday. And uh, Hezbollah is, of course, uh, controlled by Iran. Iran views it as a division, it led the Lebanese division of the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. Um, and so Hezbollah is Iran. and Islamic Jihad, which uh, purportedly was the organization that shot at the uh, southern Golan Heights from Syria, um, is controlled by Iran. It was founded by Iran in 1988. Um, and Hamas is largely controlled today by Iran. It's going through a Shiification. Uh, its uh, central operatives are in Iran or in Qatar that are working in conjunction with Iran. So that's Hamas. So this isn't a Hamas operation. This is an Iranian operation. Um, and we have to be aware of that. Now, why would Iran be striking right now? Well, it's striking right now because it's uh, for two reasons. One, it's its own operational timetable. Iran, as we know, is at the gates of an independent nuclear uh, capability, um, nuclear military nuclear capability. Uh, they've reached that nuclear threshold with the quantities of enriched uranium that they now possess at least at 60% purity uh, and capable, uh, very clearly capable of enriching to weapons grade 90% uh, enrichment uh, is now at the level, the quantity that they've stored up is uh, or amassed is, is enough to build a bomb. And that's just what we know, of course. That's what they've allowed the International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors to see. So everything that they allow the inspectors to see, we have to assume, is a cover for um, much, much more that they're not allowing them to see. So Iran is at the cusp of becoming um, a nuclear-armed state. Um, and uh, they don't want Israel to attack. And they know that uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has only decided to re remain in politics and return to office uh, today because he has unfinished business to take care of with Iran to prevent them from becoming a nuclear power. So they're anticipating an Israeli attack. And so this is a preemptive attack on their part. And, and you know, part of that is to keep your enemy busy. And part of that is because they know just by the way, like the Chinese know, the Chinese are apparently amassing an armada around Taiwan. Um, and the United States um, has lacks, apparently, by all accounts, the capacity to provide Taiwan with the arms that it needs to defend itself. Well, the same is largely, is largely true for Israel. The United States 
has transferred the emergency stores of munitions that it generally keeps in Israel in three different bases here uh, for emergency use by either American forces or Israeli forces, and they've transferred most of those stores to Ukraine. Um, and uh, aside from that, um, if uh, Israel finds itself in a war uh, with Iran, the United States at home doesn't have in its own storage um, uh, the ability. They've depleted their own their own inventories of munitions because of Ukraine. And uh, so if Israel were to need an airlift of, 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 munici of, of munitions or missiles, uh, in the event of a war, the United States would be unable to supply them uh, in all likelihood. And finally, uh, what we saw in the aftermath of Guardian of the Walls in, uh, in May of 2021 is that the Democrats in Congress are, uh, are extremely hostile, exceedingly hostile to Israel, and they didn't want to replenish Israel's stocks of Iron Dome missiles after that uh, operation, after that uh, military struggle, uh, mini-war with Hamas. Um, in 2021. So what's already happened is likely going to happen again. And of course, uh, the administration now uh, is guided in its policy vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians by Hadi Amar, uh, who is a special envoy for the Palestinians. And he is not simply um, uh, n not not particularly opposed to Hamas, he's made statements and taken actions that indicate both in and out of office that he's sympathetic. He's sympathetically inclined towards Hamas and its agenda of annihilating Israel. So um, this is this is the point, man, that the United States has now under the Biden administration for all things Palestinian. So part of Iran's interest here is that they want to strike now because uh, this is a way to distract Israel and make it um, difficult as a practical matter for Israel to take decisive actions to block Iran's path to a nuclear arsenal. Um, and the other reason that Iran, of course, would be attacking today is because Israel is distracted by domestic unrest by an insurrection that our elite are carrying out against the government, and therefore the government is weak. Um, and the most important aspect of that is the, the role that uh, Israel's deep state, including its military brass, is playing in the insurrection. And specifically, it appears to be leading that insurrection there was a report today in the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, and Wall Street Journal uh, about uh, one of the documents that was purloined, leaked from the Pentagon, one of about 100 apparently top secret documents that was leaked um, uh, from the Pentagon. And uh, this, most of them, of course, as we know from the reports, were about Ukraine. Uh, this one was about um, Israel and about what's happening inside of Israel. And I have it here. The heading is Israeli Mossad encourages protests against new government over proposed judicial reforms. This is something was a report originated in the CIA's intelligence update from March 1st. And it's relying on communications intercepted by uh, U.S. spy agencies against Israel uh, in uh, mid to late February. And according to the report, um, the body says in early to mid-February, Israeli secret intelligence service Mossad leaders advocated for Mossad officials and Israeli citizens to protest against the new Israeli government's proposed judicial reforms, including several explicit calls to action that decried the Israeli government according to Signals Intelligence. So that's that's the report that uh, came out uh, on Sunday. And uh, what it indicates very clearly is that um, at a minimum, the uh, Biden administration 
which is informed by these daily uh, intelligence estimates pr uh, put out by the CIA, by the Pentagon, by the different intelligence agencies, that the Biden administration has been operating under the understanding that the protests against the Netanyahu government are being fomented by Mossad and presumably by other Israeli security agencies. We know uh, from a news report in late February that um, the uh, that there are officers in Mossad that had asked to participate in the anti-government rallies and that the Mossad's legal advisor had told them they were allowed to do so uh, under a certain rank, which is probably roughly parallel to either uh, major or lieutenant colonel, um, and that uh, and that uh, they can't I do they can't do so as Mossad operatives. Uh, that was an open uh, news report in Israel, um, and so the disparity between what was reported in Israel around the same time as the reporting from this. Uh, Pentagon document came out is that the Israeli news report was that the uh, initiative to participate in anti-government uh, demonstrations uh, said that it was a bottom-up initiative, whereas the U.S. intelligence report said that it's a top-down initiative. So that's important, but it's not critical for understanding what we're facing here because the fact is, either way, the top brass of the Mossad uh, supported or at least did not prevent and, as a result, gave a backwind to a participation by officers in the Mossad uh, in anti-governmental protests, which now uh, the declared goal of those protests, now that the government has sort of taken a few steps back on its judicial reform agenda, which was an ostensible you know, uh, cause or rationale for the mass rioting against the government and the violence against government ministers and members of Knesset that we've been experiencing for the past two and a half months or three months. Um, that this is all about overthrowing the government. Ewood Barak, who's sort of the uh, mastermind of everything that's happening, the former uh, prime minister, former chief of staff of the army, uh, attested to the fact that the purpose of these uh, protests is to overthrow the government in a lecture that he gave to a group of uh, of uh, professors that was uh, posted on YouTube last week. Um, so it's open that, that this was pre-planned. It was premeditated. The purpose of these uh, protests, of the violence, of the demonization of the government and of Netanyahu and of his ministers and of the members of Knesset that are members of the governing coalition of 64 out of 120 seats in the Knesset, that the goal is not to block Judea, Judea, judicial reform per se, it is to overthrow Netanyahu's government and to ban Netanyahu from politics. Um, and this very clearly is being carried out in cahoots with the firm and open support of the Supreme Court, Supreme Court President Esther Hayut, former Supreme Court President Aaron Barak. Uh, the Attorney General uh, is perhaps the most active member of the uh, opposition or the resistance, as it's now coined itself, uh, in Israel, trying to undermine every single uh, government uh, initiative and action uh, from her position as Attorney General. Um, and it's also being led by former retired generals and chiefs of staff of the IDF, including Ehud Barak. Uh, so this is this is pretty amazing. And the last thing that we have to say about that is that it's also very openly supported by the American government, as we've talked about in in previous weeks. Uh, not only uh, Secretary of State Blinken and Ambassador Nides has been an open participant in the anti-government operations here. But also President Biden, of course, shockingly announced uh, a week and a half ago that uh, Netanyahu, the prime minister of an allied country, is effectively persona non grata in Washington, that he will not be invited to Washington anytime soon. Uh, and Biden told him that uh, the that the administration, he said it to microphones, that the administration does not support judicial reform and opposes any uh, any action 
uh, to limit in any way the power of Israel's very progressive, very woke, very anti-Zionist uh, justices who are self-selecting. Uh, so that that was um, that's what's going on at the same time that uh, Iran has has opened up this uh, very very devastating multi-pronged attack against Israel uh, when we are in a moment of peril, existential peril, vis-a-vis -vis the nuclear uh, program uh, and uh, other things. And and um, and one one other aspect we we have to talk about with that is what is driving the opposition. And here, too, I think that we have to start an analysis of this uh, with the Palestinians, because, of course, the Palestinians, whether it's the uh, Hamas terrorists or the Fatah terrorists from from uh, the, the ruling coalition of the uh, Palestinian Authority that the United States uh, funds and supports and trains its military forces, et cetera, or, or Islamic Jihad, um, or Israeli Arab leaders who support uh, Israel's demise. Um, we have we have to realize that um, as we've spoken about on this show for over the past year and a half, two years, it's now 101 shows. So how long does that make it? Almost two years of broadcasting here. Um, the Palestinian Authority, such as it is, has collapsed. I mean, we've seen it very clearly in Janin. Janin, when you hear about a new terrorist organization called the Lion's Den, which is really just Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and and Fatah guns for hire, etc. There is no Palestinian Authority. There's no Palestinian Authority in, in Nablus. And there's no Palestinian Authority in Janin. There's very little Palestinian Authority anywhere, not in Hebron, not in Tukaram, not in I mean, in Ramallah, they can they can control sort of the the area around uh, Mahmoud Abbas's uh, headquarters, but I mean that's about it. They don't command the respect or the support of the public, and they haven't for well over a decade and a half. I mean, it's all a shell, uh, and it exists uh, because the United States and Europe are propping it up. It exists because the IDF, which is addicted to the concept of subcontracting our fight against terrorism to terrorists is propping it up. But in it and of itself has no no existence, no independent existence. And so when left to stand on its own, it can't. Because its people hate Israel and Jews and want to annihilate Israel, they never abandoned that jihadist or Baathist uh, ideology, depending on who you talk to, of annihilating Israel and annihilating the Jewish state uh, and replacing it with with a different uh, entity and state, not a state. They, it, it never is really spelled out. All it is about is annihilating the Jewish state. Um, the, the Palestinian Authority, which was a creation of the Oslo uh, peace process from uh, 1993, so 30 years ago, um, it, it's done. It's over, and um, and and uh, and and we have to look then to understand what's driving the generals, what's driving the jurists, what's driving the at least in part the the ten thousand, twenty thousand, upwards up to over a hundred thousand leftists who have come out to fight the government, to call for its overthrow, who demonize the prime minister, who demonize his voters, who demonize his coalition partners, who demonize Likud ministers, Likud members of Knesset. What's driving? Well, I think in part it has to do with, well, it has to do with really two things. And this is something that, that really came out clearly in a, in a recent conversation that I had with David Wormser, who you guys are familiar with because he's a frequent guest on this show. And and when I was talking about it with David, uh, he suggested, and I think rightly, that, that Oslo really was about two things, roughly. Obviously, it's about many things. But one of the things that Oslo was about is this idea that, you know, uh, Israel, and, and again, this is also something that I talked about with Yoram Chazoni, if you remember that episode a few weeks back, also is predicated on this notion 
the you know the the moderates the moderate jews and the moderate arabs would get together and together they would fight the extremists on both sides and it was so it was all about a moral uh leveling between the terrorists the palestinians the plo the you know the first sort of uh, architects of of modern terrorism that that reached its uh, apex with the 9/11 attacks by al qaeda uh, who credited the PLO with being their inspiration to fight America with terrorism through air, airline hijackings. Um, but the idea was that the PLO was going to be moderate now in this new post-Cold War era, in the moment of uh, the apex of American power in the early 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union. The PLO was going to suddenly abandon genocide, the annihilation of Israel as its, I mean, as its as its guiding concept for peace with Israel, and uh, they were going to join together with Israeli moderates and fight uh, terrorists, as Rabin famously said, Yitzhak Rabin, uh, without the Supreme Court and without the B'Tselem anti-Israel organization that kept petitioning to, and continues to this day uh, petitioning the uh, uh, progressive post-Zionist Supreme Court in Israel against the IDF. So he thought that without those obstacles to adequately fight, fighting terrorism, that Arafat was going to succeed where he, Yitzhak Rabin, and the IDF had failed. Um, so that um, that was the concept, that they they we would subcontract our our defense to terrorists and they would now being moderate and all uh fight it. So that was um it was a crazy concept. Uh and it was indes it indefensible on any rational level. But it was an idea that had taken hold uh throughout the Western world that the moderates were now in charge and uh it took hold of, of Israeli of the Israeli elites. Um, and it failed, as we see. It was we've been seeing it failed for thirty years, and now it's basically done. Um, and the other thing that Oslo did that was extremely corrosive, particularly for Israel's ruling class, is that it 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 is inherently an an anti-Jewish concept. It's an anti-Jewish concept first and foremost because it places the guilt and the blame for the absence of peace in the Middle East on, on the Jews. It says that the Jewish state is responsible for the absence of peace in, Israel, in, in the Middle East, not only with the Palestinians, but throughout the Middle East, as Bill Clinton once famously said, because Israel is too large. And the way to solve the Palestinian conflict with Israel and through it, every conflict in the Middle East is for Israel to contract. And yield land, yield Judea and Samaria, yield Jerusalem and Gaza uh, to the PLO, uh, and then everybody will be at peace and everybody will be happy, and there won't be any point in anybody in the Arab world fighting uh, one another, or certainly or Israel, and certainly not fighting the United States. And therefore, all of the blame for everything that happens uh, uh, in a negative way in the Middle East is Israel's. So it was anti-Jewish in that sense, but it was also anti-Jewish in another sense, which is that, you know, for 4,000 years, um, the land of Israel has been the birthright of every Jew since the time of Abraham, and certainly since the time of Joshua, 3,300 years ago. And Oslo um, said, well, no, 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 we're going to give up our birthright. And it would be one thing. If this had been a consensus view of the Jewish people in Israel, but it wasn't. The Rabin Paris government that passed the Oslo deal through Knesset was a minority government. It didn't even have a Knesset majority. And how did it get one? By bribing two corrupt members of Knesset from the secular right wing party, uh, Tzomet. One of them, Gonen Segev was made energy minister. Today, he's sitting in jail for the rest of his life because he tried to sell state secrets to Iran. That was his second offense after a previous incarceration for selling ecstasy. So this is a criminal. And the second guy was this fellow named Alex Goldbar Goldfarb, and he was made a deputy minister. And in exchange for becoming a deputy minister and raising his hand in favor of the Oslo deal, 
um, he got a uh, he got a government car, and so everybody said that uh, our birthright our birthright was stolen for Mitsubishi. Um, and that is how it went. And and it was that precedent that you could change the character of Israel. You could re renounce uh, the birthright of the entire Jewish people uh, in perpetuity uh, through this sort of uh, political uh, uh, horse trading with people who were 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 de were defying their own voters um this became a norm for the left in israel whether it was the withdrawal from gaza that followed whether it's most recently the gas deal that uh that the lapid bennett government signed uh or acceded to with with lebanon which gave israeli territorial waters our economic waters and most importantly our natural gas to iran through uh, Lebanon, which is controlled again by Hezbollah, which is Iran. Um, these were all made without the majority support in the Knesset or in the or in the pe or in the nation, and it became just a modus operandi of the left that this is how you do things. You make radical changes in the way that things are done in Israel, in the way that the country views itself and its role in Jewish history and Jewish destiny. Uh, without the without the support of the Jewish people, and, and that is something that was extremely corrosive, obviously to the left, but also to all of Israel. And here we have an absolute majority of Israelis who just brought in a government that opposes this. And the final aspect of the rationale of the elite, who, according to this document, and also from what we know, has been playing an active role. Uh, in fomenting this insurrection and threatening civil war for the past three and a half months, is that they're also extremely um, tied to the American left. And here, you know, I'll just say I've been slowly, slowly, uh, because it's it's a very heavy book, uh, going through uh, Walter Russell Mead's book, uh, The Ark of Covenant. And it's an extremely important book. And... Um, one of the things that, that Mead writes that I think is very, very key for understanding what's happening in Israel today is um, he talks about how uh, America sort of started falling apart after the end of the Cold War when it seemed to be most triumphant. And uh, and, and in fact, I mean, what, what's most interesting about his book is that it really isn't about Israel and explaining America's ties to the Jewish state uh, Mead really talks about what America is, because support for Israel has been woven into the fabric of American life uh, since the time of the Founding Fathers, and really since the time of the Pilgrims. Um, but uh, but when they wanted to come to the New World and found a New Jerusalem. But um, what what Mead writes in, in the book uh, that, that's very important to understand in order to understand what's happening in Israel is that uh, the left in the United States, its component parts, uh, began re-examining the foundations of the American identity uh, beginning in the 1990s as a result, not so much of the victory in the Cold War so much as a result of the dawn of the digital age and the globalization that came in its way. And um, these twin forces, in various ways, began eroding uh, the moral, the, the, the widespread acceptance of the morality of America, um, the myth of America, if you will. The, the concept of an American mission in the world, the concept of America being a new Jerusalem. If, if the role of the Jews is to be a light unto the nation, then the role of America was to be the crusading nation that brought light, not in the sense of uh, by the sword, but it, the light of freedom actually bringing democracy to the world. Uh, in many ways through the sword in World War I and World War II and so on. And, and of course, uh, Operation Enduring Freedom, Operation Iraqi Freedom, the same concept guiding the American elite, the American establishment, that the United States is a force of good in the world, that American ideals are in some sense universal ideals, and that the United States can bring these ideals to the world 
and that American power is also a testament to the rightness of those ideals. American prosperity is a testament to the rightness of those ideals of freedom, of individual freedom, etc. So what Mead argues is that after the Cold War, and again, as a result of the twin forces of digitalization or the digi digital revolution, the digital age that we live in, and uh, globalization, that um, many on the left in particular started questioning the basic moral foundations of the United States. And uh, the digital age caused a uh, breakup of the middle class in the United States, where the working class and the upper middle class, the professional class became more and more alienated from each other as, as the globalization uh, it gutted American manufacturing. Um, and so when the middle class began breaking up, uh, a lot of people started looking at the income disparity and saying that America was basically structurally racist and evil. And so as the left became more radicalized in the intervening 30 years, again, this is starting around the time of Oslo, until the present day, um, they became more disenchanted with the United States itself. That is, they became more anti-American. And what we've seen over the same corresponding period is as they've decided that the United States is not the new Jerusalem, but actually sort of a Sodom, um, that Jerusalem itself, the Jewish state, is not uh, light unto the nations. It's evil. It's a colonial power. It's a settler colonialism or whatever they call Zionism and so on and so forth. So that the the anti-Americanism and the anti-Semitism of the left go hand in hand. But the Israeli elite hasn't really understood that. They're in a way useful idiots for uh, woke left in the United States that is selling this concept of American venality um, uh, to the American people because the Israeli elite are generals who are brought into this gestalt through the Pentagon, which has also gone woke in recent in recent years. Um, our generals don't understand what's really happened in the United States or what's happening in the United States and what it means that uh, Americans in positions of leadership and certainly the Biden administration is is very much uh, inspired by this concept uh, that that it isn't it isn't about uh, this policy that Israel enacts or that policy and it isn't simply a question of whether they would have supported uh, Lapid more than Netanyahu because what what really um, is informing them as we see through the actions of people like Robert Malley vis a vis Iran and Hadi Amar vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the Palestinians, is that they're simply hostile to Israel. They were hostile to Israel under the Lapid uh, Bennett government, and they're hostile to Israel now. And yet, rather than recognize this, recognize that Israel is a partisan issue because you have one side of the American partisan divide that has just simply become very anti-American and anti-Israel, and the other that uh, at, at its finest moments is trying to maintain the American ideal and in part and parcel of that support Israel. Um, we had Bennett go to the United States and say, you know, he wanted to meet with Biden. He met with Biden and he boycotted the Republicans. You had Lapid in his first day at the foreign ministry saying that their focus in the United States uh, in his government during his tenure as foreign minister was going to be uh, a meeting of the minds of rebuilding ties with the American Jewish left, um, and that uh, they weren't going to pay that much attention. And in fact, they paid no attention to evangelical Christians who make up the backbone of American support for Israel. So we have these elites who don't understand what's going on in the United States. We have American Jews who don't really necessarily understand what's happening in the United States. Um, and that's why I think Mead's book is so... Uh, important because he 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 puts it all together beautifully, and then he places Israel in this in this bifurcation of American society between people who still value American ideals and the American creed, as he calls it, and people who think that it's a lie and that America was born in the sin of slavery and structural racism, uh, and so. 
we have an we have an elite in Israel that doesn't understand fundamentally what's happened to the United States is clinging to the support that they receive. It's instrumental support, but they actually don't recognize it as such. That it's not they don't understand that it's just in order to get to a certain place. They think that uh, it's real and that what they have is shared values. But they only have shared values if their values become anti-Semitism. Um, and by the way, we've had some expressions of that as well. So it's not that this is impossible. It, it's actually happening in 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 many quarters on the left. Um, and, and so this is a perfect storm. You know, this is a perfect storm where we have our elite uh, betraying the country. You know, saying that they're trying to overthrow the government, not recognizing the legitimacy of the decision of the people of Israel uh, in the elections, um, seeking support from outside powers, first and foremost, the Biden administration, misunderstanding the nature of that administration's view, not only of Israel, but more fundamentally of the United States and what that means for Israel. And we have Iran, who's watching all of this. You know, I've been uh, following the Iranian media through uh, the Twitter posts of a of a fellow named uh, Michael Siegel, I think is at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, and he's showing that the Iranian media is actually quoting in very prominent headlines all of the things against the government uh, that are being said by uh, retired generals um, and giving huge prominence to it as proof that Israel is cracking up. So all of this is happening at at this time, and and you know I'll just leave you with this. I mean this is all very very disturbing, and I'll and I'll leave you with this. You know uh, in his in his eulogy for Maya and uh, Rina D, uh, their rabbi from here in in Efrat, uh, Rabbi Bernstock, uh, he he talked about the portion of the Torah that we're going to be reading on on the coming Shabbat uh, Shemini. And uh, it's a, it's sort of a, it, it starts, it's a happy thing. They go into the, uh, uh, the Mishkan, the, uh, the, the temple where the, the tabernacle that they, that they built in the, in the desert. And, uh, you know, Moses had, had basically given the, uh, um, the uh, lead to his brother Aaron and Aaron's sons uh, to carry out the sacrifices and everything. Uh, in accordance with with God's laws, and so Aaron's two sons, uh, uh, after all the festivities, they they are killed. God kills them because they lit uh, what's called a uh, um, a strange flame. Uh, that they were they did something that they weren't supposed to do. They made a sacrifice that they were were not supposed to do, and so he killed them. And, it, you know, there's a lot of discussion among the rabbis why they were killed. Uh, were they drunk, some people say, and they were, um, they, they, were uh, they were making the, the sanctuary impure, or, or were they simply their religious fervor was too strong? And so when Rabbi Bernstock's uh, eulogy of, of Maya and Rina Adi today, he, he compared them to Abraham's sons. And he said that one of the uh, interpretations of what happened of their death is that they were these shining lights. They were so bright that they just were too good for this world, effectively, and God brought them to him. And he compared the girls with, with Aaron's sons. And and Aaron, of course, uh, famously, uh, after his sons were, were, were killed, after they died, uh, he 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 went silent. He went mute. And then uh, Rabbi Bernstock recalled that uh, there's a very famous uh, verse in the Torah where they talk about how uh, God spoke to Aaron. And the question that the rabbis ask is, well, why did why did God speak directly to Aaron? Why didn't he go through Moses? Why didn't Moses talk to Aaron and repeat what God had said and so on and so forth? This is the first direct communication between God and, and Aaron, the, the priest. And and the answer that they give in, in the literature, Rabbi Bernstock said, was because Aaron's silence 
Satan made him listen. He heard God talking to him because he was quiet. And and Rabbi Bernstock ended his eulogy for the girl saying, that, you know, at this time when Israel is so riven and also so threatened, I mean, look what just happened, look what we just buried today. Two jewels, two women, young women, pure uh, souls, just huge loss, and their mother who's fighting for her life. And he said that, you know, maybe this is the time for us to stop screaming and to start listening. And maybe we'll hear one another and maybe we'll hear God. But uh, perhaps we need to take this time to just be quiet and not yell and not scream and try to come together. Because the truth of the matter is, you know, you're going to get... All of these crazy people, I mean, they had, after the after the girls were murdered, after the terrorist attack in Tel Aviv Friday night, Saturday night, you had yet another rally of these people who want to bring down the government. Yeah, no judicial reform, right? This is all just about getting rid of the government, not letting the, child, the people's will, will out, right? uh, getting rid of representative democracy because your side can't win elections. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and they say that this is a fake war and, and the government is, is inciting the terrorism to try to change the subject. I mean, just crazy things. No Iran, no Hezbollah, no nothing. And and we we need to peel off the not crazy people uh, in in this group. And we need to get together as a people. We don't have any choice. I mean, this is this is the big one that's upon us. We are being attacked from all quarters, and we have to stand up to survive. So we lost huge on Friday, and uh, unfortunately, I feared that that uh, much suffering awaits us, but. If we're to persevere as a people, we have to do it here. Stop looking to others to try to save us, whether in Washington or anywhere else, and just find it within us to work together and um, recognize that Jewish destiny is is all of ours, and uh, it's indivisible, even when we're divided. So we should just take from the Torah, and we should take from Rabbi Bernstock's eulogy of uh, of the girls uh, that wisdom and go forward uh, quietly and try to find our bearings because we have a storm that's already upon us. So those are my thoughts, and uh, and and we just have to do the best we can. But we're not in an easy time right now, so. Thanks for listening.